Hello everyone, we are here in the fourth installment of our week on embroidered narratives and in the in the last installment we are talking about the Kanthas from Bengal, the Kantha quilts of Bengal. So we'll start our discussion continuing what we have already started and here I want to talk about little bit on the different kind of practices which are related to making Kanthas. So for example, if we see it here in the left side of the screen we have section of the Kantha that we have already discussed discussed in which we see this warrior goddess Kali and then of course how she is fighting the her enemies and then we, we can see the kind of figuration that is used there this flowy lines which are which sort of constitutes the contours of the figures that we have there and also the narrative progression that how this profile figures they are used and how they sort of like I mean if they are facing each other or if all of them are going in one direction so how that also guides the viewers eyes to read the narrative or sort of experience this part of the narrative in the Kantha. So this is a kind of tendency we also find that those are there in the Bengali scroll paintings. So scrolls are something we find them to be they are made on pieces of paper which are mounted on used fabric and then like I mean those papers are sort of used with glue or gum and then they are pasted on the fabric for stability and on the top of that these images are drawn and then there are particular uh, ways in which like I mean the ground is prepared and then how the pigment based colors are used on the top of the scrolls for executing the visuals something around like that we have see we see in the right side of the screen in this case is what we find there are those vertical scrolls and those in the vertical scrolls they are unfolded and folded at times of telling narratives so in that case what happens we see that the, in those vertical scrolls there are usually horizontal registers in which episodes of a particular narrative is depicted so that can also be from the Hindu epics like Ramayana Mahabharata that can also be from Muslim saints so for example a Ghazi's narrative and so on so there are many different kind of narratives we find them to be there in this painted scrolls so in this painted scrolls we also find this a particular kind of figuration in which we see that the this the profile view at the same time like I mean how the figures are constructed not really like bony structures but then it's almost like I mean showing the flesh in the body but also at the same time making them much more relatable and following the kind of like the figures or like I mean the following the kind of body types we find predominantly in Bengal and part of Eastern India so those things we find them to be there also like the dressing style so for example in this scroll when we see it we see that I mean this comes from mid 19th century from Bishnupur this area where we have already studied this Baluchar brocades and then this scroll also comes from the same region and in this one we see episode of Ramayana in which we find that I mean Lord Rama and Sita or Janaki Devi both of them are like I mean shown here at the center stage and then we find perhaps this is Lakshmana and then this is Bharata so all of them are there in the scene and then of course this is perhaps Hanuman who we see that I mean in the almost in the margin of the scene so this is if you think about it that how the narratives are constructed by sort of emphasizing this Bengali types of body 19th century this attire with this particular kind of hat and then like I mean this pajama and this jama and so on so all those things we can find them to be there in the Kanthas as well because a lot of Kanthas we find them we find today in the museum collections they come from 19th century or early and later 20th century so we can see there are certain kind of overlapping so it might mean that there are a sort of correlation between the scroll making, kantha making and so on. Now the scroll making is something we find them to be there which are made by particular communities of patuas or the scroll painters who are also involved in making idols. So now the thing is one can consider that I mean what is the relationship between this specific group of artisans who are called patuas and then kantha which are made by women members of family across Bengal. So one can think about it as a way in which like how the scrolls are something which are sort of like I mean they are rolled and then like I mean brought to the village homes by the storytellers they would unfold 
the or like i mean they will unroll the scrolls and then they will show it to the audience they will depict the story and then they will roll it again and then they will take those scrolls with them so this kind of practices we can consider that how bringing this particular scrolls to the village homes everywhere that also enables people to see this kind of figuration at the same time we can also consider that how similar kind of figuration are there in the terracotta temple motifs like i mean the terracotta flex and so on something we have already studied in context of baluchor making and so on so in those cases also we find that how the similar kind of visuals like the figuration the kind of this profile view of the figures narration and so on those are incorporated in making this scrolls or the terracotta plex and so on how those things are then reflected in the kathas so we are not really talking about one person is copying from the others but it seems that they are also part of a shared visual culture in which they know that what is happening the scroll painters would know about that what the katha makers are doing in the domestic spaces and then like i mean the people in the village homes they would also get to see these scrolls when these performances take place so this is how we find that how there is a exchange of knowledge and this visual knowledge we can consider it and that sort of makes this similarity between one another now the other kind of practice we also find that has relevance in this case are those bengali wooden dolls the wooden dolls are something those are not only just used for votive purpose or for ritualistic use or for also like i mean for playing but also like i mean the wooden idols we find that i mean large size wooden idols are also worshiped in the temples and mostly we find that the vaishnava idols so for example images of krishna or images of chaitanya dev or gornitai and so on we find them to be there made in wood and those wooden idols would also have this kind of figuration and so this well rounded figure that we find in the kathas in the scroll paintings are also there in the wooden dolls so that way we can consider that how the similar visual vocabulary was present for a number of people who belong to different sections of the society like i mean the women in the domestic space or in the community setting and then the patuas and then like of course this this wooden doll makers or the or the wooden toy makers so this is these are the ways in which we can see how um, this this practice of making katha even though we consider it as something that is done in the domestic spaces mostly by women i mean predominantly by women so is not something that is again disconnected from how the other forms of practices they evolved over time now the other thing we also need to consider that when we are talking about katha we cannot really think that it's just a hindu practice or it's just a muslim practice and then there are also speculations about whether the hindu practices they preferred figurative narrations than the ones who are the muslim women but then we cannot really make a very straightforward or a simplistic distinction like that because we find that there are also scroll paintings of ghazi and like i mean the islamic saints and so on who are also depicted on the scroll paintings and similarly we do not really know always that if particular kathas are made completely by hindu women or muslim women in which we find there is a combination of geometric motifs and then figurative motifs and so on so there is not really a clear distinction we can make that these are hindu imagery these are islamic imagery but then there are always like i mean this combination of both so this kind of practices they also tell us about the exchanges between the religious groups and no stark division between the communities they have inhabited in bengal and also like i mean other parts of the indian subcontinent now from there i just wanted to talk a little bit about this particular kind of quilted fabric which is called kolcha or golcha and this is a very specific kind of fabric quilted fabric we find them to be there made in satgaon or saptogram and that's in the hugli district of bengal and it was a port city in the early modern period and we find that a particular kind of this golchas were created in 17th century and in which we find this fine muslin or fine cotton cloth is used again unbleached and in this cotton 
cotton cloth, we find that the threads which are used on this cotton cloth are very regulated. That I mean, it does not really create a high contrast between like I mean the figure and the ground. And then like I mean this gold chairs are then like I mean very carefully mounted. So for example, here we see the border that is added by the sides of this gold chair. And this were made for Portuguese consumption. It was not really we do not really find much evidence about whether these were used by the local people in Bengal. And in this gold chairs, what we find that I mean, since it was made for the Portuguese consumption, and whatever the gold chairs we have existing today, none of them are there in Bengal. But then some of them are there in Lisbon, the museum collection, or there in the other museum collection. So, for example, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and so on. So, in this case, what we see that it sort of draws on the making of Kantha. So for example, the divisions we find in terms of like making the borders sort of reaching towards the center. If one can see the center here, there is a clear area which is confined and sort of like I mean it announces that this is the center of this fabric and then all the other narratives what we see around there can be those narrative panels like this or like I mean there are those horizontal or like I mean those long narrative scenes which sort of like I mean flow through these borders. So all those things we find them there and then it sort of like I mean definitely reminds us of the Katha and then like in terms of the stitches we find both running stitch and then also chain stitch and all those are used in this whole jazz. Now the other thing we find that there is a tendency towards standardizing the compositional format that to make it much more sort of regularized which was not there in the Kathas and it is rightly so because if it is for overseas consumption or if it is made for a particular trade relation then those kind of regularities come into play. So in terms of that if we see that I mean Golchas are something we can consider to be closely connected to the Kathas then we also find that there are certain kind of similarities in terms of making this kind of quilted fabric but then there are also dissimilarities. So for example if these are made for particular kind of consumption and that's the reason the materials are carefully selected. It's not really used fabric those are selected for it but new fabric and then new thread and yarn those are used for making the embroidery and even though the kind of compositional format and certain imagery and also like the figuration and all those things we can find them to be similar to the ones we find in Katha but then we also see that how the this the regularized sort of approach towards making the Golchas are something that is very different from the making of the community based activities that is prevalent in making Katha. Now since these are made for Portuguese consumption we find that certain kind of Portuguese heraldic symbols are there featured at the center and then like I mean we find it's an eclectic mix of regional imagery of many of the folk motifs and then of course like I mean certain kind of images from the mythology and so on in the Hindu mythology perhaps those are uh, there but then they are also met by uh, images of European cupids and puttus and then like I mean of course then other imagery what we do not really see them to be featured in this Kathas for regional consumption. So this sort of also says that I mean if this was made for a particular time and also it was made for a particular market then it evolved in 17th century and at the same time we find that to have died out also in the 17th century. Whereas for Kathas something that had been relevant for the local communities they have been made for centuries and then like I mean they sustained and then they survived because of the involvement of the people in the households and in the community. So in those aspects we can find how making Katha, making Golcha this comes similar and both are from Bengal but then like I mean how one kind of fabric had survived and the other kind did not. So continuing on this on the discussion on the embroidered narratives we now then we, we can look at the making of the Rabari embroidery and Zardozi. So in terms of that what we find here is that this needle embroidery we what we have already seen is a kind of a it is a tool for drawing and at the same time writing and how those kind of ideas they sort of come up on this embroidered fabrics is something we will be discussing now. So the Rabari embroidery that we find the Rabari communities are the nomadic communities they 
inhabit in the Kutch region of Gujarat. So from Bengal that is in the eastern part of the Indian subcontinent now we are sort of moving towards the western frontier and in which we find these nomadic people they usually sort of inhabit in the areas which are much more barren and very different from the lush green riverine landscape of Bengal. And in this case what we see that the nomadic communities, they, 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 um, the Rabadi communities and within the Rabadi communities we also have like I mean different other subgroups and they were perhaps uh, primarily from Rajasthan and then they moved through Sindh region and then they arrived in uh, this 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 area in in Kutch which is now part of Gujarat and so in this case what we see that they also have rich tradition of making embroidery and on screen we have this one uh, Rabari boy's jacket and that comes from uh, 20th century and this is something in which we can see that how this undyed cotton is used for making the jacket or the jama and on the top of that we find this extensive use of embroidery this use of this brightly colored threads and with that we also find that mirror works mirrors are like I mean frequently used in this kind of embroidery also at the same time shells and cowries and things like that they are added uh, like on the top of this embroidered fabrics so this kind of like this specific uh, embroidery tradition we find them to be there in the Rabadi community now textile historian at the same time textile activist Judy Fretter has extensively worked on the Rabari embroidery and the textile makers in Gujarat and she argues that how the Rabari communities when they started moving from Rajasthan so it was not really that time when this stitching or this embroidery tradition or like the practice that came with them but when they moved from Rajasthan to the Sindh region it seems that I mean that is the kind of time when they started adopting or like I mean became familiar with particular kind of embroidery techniques and the other forms of visual making which are much more geometric and abstracted and so those geometric imagery that stayed with the Rabadi communities and when they eventually sort of to the Kutch region we find them to have flourished into this making of the embroidery. Now Freter also argues that this kind of embroidery is perhaps been learned from the Mochi community in Gujarat and if you remember that we have looked into this hunting coat of Jahangir's reign and which was perhaps made by the Mochi community in Gujarat and we have already mentioned that how those Mochi community members were predominantly male and they were the professional embroiders. So when Freter sort of suggest that how the Rabari communities may have learned this kind of embroidery techniques because this chain stitch or the Ari stitch that we see both in the Mochi embroidery as well as in the Rabari embroidery are very similar. So in this case one can also draw certain kind of inferences between them and so if they have learned the Rabadi embroiders have learned from the Mochi community we can also see how the community structures in those two cases are very different because the Mochi community members the ones who are who were the embroiders were predominantly men in terms of the Rabadi embroiders we find the women members in the family would be the ones who are involved in doing this embroidery. So the community structure completely changes but then like the, uh, the way of doing this embroidery remains very similar. Now for the mochi embroidery we find that a varied range of images were created. So for example those figurative motifs in the Shikarga compositional format that we have seen in the hunting court of Jahangir's period. So th those kind of things we have seen. However, what Freter says that during uh, the, the Rabari communities move towards the Sindh region, this, this abstracted geometric imagery which is prevalent in the Sindh region had stayed uh, or made a huge impact on the community members, uh, the, the Rabari community members and that is how this, this geometric motifs became much more prevalent in the Rabari uh, embroidered fabrics as well. So 
when I say that there are geometric and abstracted imagery, that does not mean that they do not have figurative motives. They do have figurative motives in terms of like certain kind of recognizable animal motives, objects or humans, but then they are much more simplified and then they are the forms and, and the shapes and everything, they are much more close to the geometric motives which we also see them to be there featured in this Rabari embroidered fabrics. So this kind of like I mean this embroidered fabrics one can also consider that if there are the geometric and representational imagery those are both present there and we see that I mean there is also this other aspect in the Rabari embroidery that comes up very prominently and that is the how the adaptability of different kind of situation is something that also affects the embroidery making. So the embroidery making even though we are talking about the geometric images and then like if there are also representational images they come close to the geometricity but then we can also see that even within this kind of scheme there are many changes which are registered in making of this kind of embroidery embroidered fabrics and that is the reason what Judy Fretter also considers that why this kind of making of the fabric is also a way of writing their expressions onto the fabric with the help of needle. So what happens in this case we see that I mean the Rabadi communities as Judy Fretter argues that they are highly adaptive to different kind of changes that can be environmental changes that can be socio-economic changes and so on and one of the instances that she registers is that in around 1995 the community this subgroup of the Dhaveria within the Rabadi community they banned the use and making of embroidery in their community in the subgroup and that happened because we find that how this kind of this Rabari embroidered fabrics which are used as like wearables at the same time they are also used as dowry cloth and so on so those things were something those became highly prized and those could delay the marriage of a woman and at a time when the women were increasingly at workspace they could not really find the time to make those highly intricate embroidered clothes and as the reason there was a need for them to sort of like I mean either stop this form of embroidery or add up new things and that is the reason this kind of drastic change came into being. So like using of embroidery or not using of embroidery in all these cases we find that embroidery becomes a very important part of the community identity which is also sort of like I mean that is flagged in Judy Fretter's argument and that's the reason what we find that the presence of the embroidery or like the absence of the embroidery both of these things they become part of understanding that why the written expressions of a community become prevalent through the use of needlework. Now the other thing we also find that in the to keep up with the pace of the time and then like I mean with the societal demands machine embroidery is also frequently added to it and then like a lot of time what happens that I mean machine embroidery is uh, used for making the outlines of the geometric shapes and then the filling is done by the hand embroiders and this is also something instead of like making a stark distinction between machine embroidery and hand embroidery the Rabari communities seem to be completely all right with like this kind of changes as Judy Fretter also argues that I mean they understand that the entire thing to be made in the hand embroidery is something that is not preferred and not really the most effective way of continuing this kind of tradition and that's the reason if there is a requirement for the intervention of the machine embroidery that has also been welcomed by the community members. So this all this kind of complex discussion that we find which concern the issues of economy, technology, available material and then like the community structure through which we find that this geometric embroidery or this uh, sort of like I mean the, the this very characteristic embroidery technique that is that is there with the Rabadi community they become a very important tool of writing their community history perhaps not in the way we find them to be there in the historical archives but in a much more uh, um, playful way which which are there preserved with the communities. I find that there is this other way of doing embroidery and that comes into being with the zardozi making. So zardozi is something in which we find that the silk 
threads which are wrapped with gold wire or like I mean silver wire which are then used for doing the embroidery on the top of this richly brocaded fabric or like silk and so on. So they are also very heavy in that sense and they are not used for day to day purpose but they are used for like particular kind of occasions. So Zardozi, Zer means gold and Dozi means wire or thread and in this case we can see that I mean this making of this gold wrapped or metal wrapped thread something we have already addressed in the earlier modules. So is something that is used here and again with either semi precious or precious stones or sometimes with pearls and sometimes with like I mean different kind of additions like sequence and so on. So those things we find them to be there in Zardozi making and it's again it's a shared practice we find that is there in parts of Central Asia part of Middle East and then of course during the early modern period that become prominent in part of northern India and Deccan India. So today we find Zardozi is made part of northern India in the areas near Agra and Lucknow, Unnao and so on and then also in Gujarat part of Bengal and then in the Deccan around the Hyderabad and so on those those areas. So in Zardozi we find that with this particular kind of technique uh, we, uh, th there is a there is a stress on making imagery which would be sometimes they are close to like I mean the Indo-Persian imagery we already seen in the in the rugs in the brocades and so on but then there are also additions to them. So for example we have this chasuble and that comes from 18th century and which is made in the Mughal workshop and then this is something in which we see that how in which we find that I mean how this imagery of the Persian flower motifs, creeper motifs they come close to this image of a pineapple which was a foreign fruit. Now this is again it's a way to understand for us that what kind of extent these techniques would go to. So there are particular kind of techniques in which the embroidery is done and in the right side of the screen is there is an image of how this embroidery is done on the fabric and we'll go in detail of that and this also shows that how different kind of cultural influences or like different kind of cultural information are brought together overlapped and then layered upon this kind of fabrics. So in other words how like writing and overwriting narratives is something that we have already been talking about is there in the Zardozi making with the help of material with the help of like this particular way of uh, embroidery. We will continue on this discussion in the next lecture. Thank you.